Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday live stream. So we got a lot of things to cover. So let's just jump right in. So just like the thumbnail and the title suggested, uh, Gary Gensler and the SEC just took a major loss, and it's rightfully so, because essentially they lied to the courts and the American public. And we're going to go into that. And this is why I think uh, this is the last time that Gary's going to be in charge of the SEC. I think he's actually going to be asked to step down, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. And we'll take a look at that. But before we do that, let's just take a look at what's going on in the market. Now, if you haven't checked your portfolio, good job. Don't, because you're not going to like it. Uh, it depends. If you're DCAing, maybe you like myself, you might be like, hey, it's a pretty good day. And we've seen that over the last seven days, it's pretty, eh, it's pretty normal, actually, for this market. I mean, it went from a nice, nice high of 73580 on March 14th to a nice well, low within seven days to 62,000. And it's amazing, like what can be done in five days. Very interesting. And of course, uh, this is not like a major pullback. Wait till we start to get 20%, 30% pullbacks and then come talk to me. Now, if you're new to crypto, welcome. You picked a perfect time to come in uh, when things are doing quite well and we have these pullbacks and some might call it a dump, some might call it a correction, wherever you want to call it, this is where we're at. And it's not just Bitcoin, of course. Now, when Bitcoin go, goes down, uh, just because uh, Bitcoin sneezes, the altcoins get a cold. And you can see that Ethereum, well, oh, BME's not doing too bad. Solana down 7.5%, uh, Avalanche 3.5%, not too bad, actually. Cardano, 4.857, 6, 2, 5, anything across the board. Eh, really, if you look at it, it's not too awful. Although for the week, if you look at the seven-day mark, I mean, 7% for Bitcoin, 15% for Ethereum, 25% up for Solana. Let's see. Is there anything bad? The only thing that, that really annoys me is that Stacks, which is what I wanted to buy more of, keeps going up. So if you're looking for uh, L2 solutions on Bitcoin, that would be your play. But yeah, a little bit of a green day. And of course, in the last hour or so where you see like the little green marks, of course, yes, people are going to buy the dip and they're going to say, hey, I, you know, I, I bought this dip and everything's great. But just wait, because I think there's more dips to come, but I could be wrong. I personally just have everything going off in the background. There's these DCA buys that just happened. So if it if it goes lower, great. If it doesn't, whatever. I mean, over the long haul, I'm feeling pretty good about this. So that's what's going on in the market. But also as a reminder, because people start to think, oh, man, we're getting into this bearishness. Not so fast. This is just a piece that came out by CNBC. The world's largest pension fund explores Bitcoin as an investment. So Japan has their own pension fund and is the largest in the world. This pension fund on Tuesday said it is requesting information on illiquidity assets, such as Bitcoin, as part of research into potential new investments. Now, look, I'm not a channel to blow smoke. This is just one pension fund. It's very large. It has like 1.5 trillion assets under management. Two things. Does that mean that all 1.5 assets are going to flow into Bitcoin? No, that's not how it works. Does this mean that it's going to happen tomorrow? No, obviously not. They're just asking for information. What's interesting that they're actually getting on the precipice and what actually caused this <laughs> number go up. It says right here, the statement comes days after Bitcoin hit an all time high and after the world's largest crypto has rallied more than 130% over the last year. So I know when people say, but that's smart money and smart money, trust me, I've met a lot of people, a lot of people in the business, a lot of Tradify people. It's not smart money. Really, it's just people who know people and they kind of manipulate things in the background. Trust me, you're much smarter than most of the people that I've known in, in, in this sector. So let me just think about that in the comments section. And also, as a quick reminder, uh, inflows and outflows. Uh, this is from BitMEX. And we can see that uh, uh, yesterday, 18th of uh, March, the inflows from BlackRock was $451 million, pretty great. But look at the outflows from Grayscale, 642. And it's like they're in a back and forth. Look at this on Friday, 139 million inflows from BlackRock and 139 million outflows from Grayscale. And it keeps going back and forth. But the eye on the prize is two things. First of all, just remember that we're still up $12 billion in, in inflow. And the initial price of around 11, 12th, or 15th of January, which is when we had a pretty reasonable amount of people, even 16th and 17th, there was a, quite a bit, is the price of Bitcoin was roughly around 43,000 to 45,000. If we don't start to hit that, I think people are relatively stable. Those will be the people who are in TradFi and the different uh, people that BlackRock and Fidelity and everybody else has talked to to bring in. 
if we start to hit those numbers of like 45K, and I'm not saying it is, 45K, 40K, 39, 38K, then the traditional finance folks that got an ETF are going to be like, hey, you said this was going to go up. You said it was volatile, but come on, I'm not used to this. I'm used to gold going up 1.2% in a year. I can't take this amount. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying usually that's what could potentially happen. Anyhow, let me know you think about that. Now let's talk about my favorite subject. I like I like what Edward Fox said in, in the comments. He said, he goes, no, don't pick on Gary. Okay, maybe a little. Yeah, he deserves it. <laughs> it's true. So this just happened this morning. <clears throat> the SEC is sanctioned for misconduct in the debt box crypto case. What is that case? Well, we actually covered this a couple of months ago, I think it was. And I didn't really think too much of it. I'm like, oh, the SEC got busted and uh, you know, slapping the rest, no big deal. But it's going to be big. Here's what we got. Judge Robert J. Shelby found the SEC initially, intentionally, misled the court about evidence it used to obtain a temporary restraining order and freeze of debt boxes asset last August. So look, I'm not a lawyer. I don't, not even going to pretend to say this, but there's a huge difference, I believe, in misleading somebody, misleading a judge in a court case, as opposed to getting the information just a little bit crooked because whatever the basis was, was incorrect. There is a massive difference. And that is going to be called out, not just here, not just in the sanctions that are coming against the SEC, but it's going to become a big issue in Congress. And we'll get to that in a second. So the SEC had claimed that, uh, this is the whole story. The SEC claimed that Debtbox perpetrated a 50 million fraudulent crypto scheme and requesting the TRO and asset freeze. The SEC, and the, the TRO is the temporary restraining order. The SEC claimed that Debtbox had already sent $720,000 overseas and would flee to the UAB, the United Arab Emirates, and secretly transfer more assets if it was not notified of the order. Basically saying like, look, they're taking all of these US taxpayers' money, and that's who we're here to protect. And we need you to shut it down, because if we don't shut it down, they're gonna take more money. And the judge said, yes, I, I agree with you. However, Shelby, Judge Shelby later reviewed his initial order and concluded the SEC had misrepresented the evidence. The 720,000 transfer was actually sent within the United States, meaning it went from one account in the US to another account in the United States. So it didn't go to the UAB. That's not great. And to get a, a perception of how big this is, there was a piece from Metal Law Man. Uh, I linked his account in the description. Vanderbilt Law, Guide to Other Worlds, Crypto Metaverse, Web3. Not legal or financial advice. I'm a lawyer, just not your lawyer. And he says, look, the opinion is devastating to the SEC as an institution and the particular lawyers who committed the misconduct. The judge made it crystal clear the SEC lawyer did not make an error. They lied intentionally. That has huge ramifications. That's not how it's supposed to be. We all pay taxes. We give this to the government, not because we like to, but because we're forced to. Those tax dollars go to these three-letter agencies. They are here to protect us, but they are not. They're doing the exact opposite. They're doing enforcement through regulation or regulation through enforcement. And it gets even worse when they lie intentionally on these court cases and they screw over some business that's just trying to operate in the United States, which is the same thing that they're, not the exact same thing, but one of the same things that's happening with the centralized exchanges. And not that they're perfect, but come on. The critical evidence the commission offered to obtain and defend the ex part TRO lacked any basis in fact, yet the commission nonetheless advanced that evidence in deliberately false and misleading ways. The SEC engaged in a gross abuse of the power entrusted to it by Congress. The judges ordered the SEC to pay the attorney's fees of the defendants in the case. That's not too bad. The judge found the SEC engaged in a gross abuse of power entrusted to it by Congress. Will Congress do anything about this? I believe they will. And if you're interested in reading this 80 page report, I linked in the description. Have fun. But now we're going to take a look at opinions across the board. This is Paul Gruel. He's the chief legal officer of Coinbase. And he pretty much echoes the same sentiment of Metal Lawman, but he says it down here, which was written out perfectly. 
The worst part of all, guess who pays the sanctions? It's us. You, me, and every U.S. taxpayer. The commission just foisted a bill onto every one of us for their litigation misconduct. So we pay the... the I'm not going to get into it. It is quite frustrating. It's crazy. And that's pretty much where we're at. So don't forget to pay your taxes. And then also, I, I, it was an interesting piece. This is from Orlando BTC, crypto and startup lawyer, founder of OC Advisory, Corporate and Regulatory Council. He said, it's rare to see federal judges admonish parties like this in a case. It's that much more rare, almost never happens, when the party is a federal government agency. I don't, I, I must be honest with you, I don't follow federal court cases quite closely. I just don't. But uh, I've never heard of sanctions against government agencies in the U.S. when they are suing private companies. I, I could be wrong. Correct me in the comment section. Uh, Orlando says, but nothing surprising me about the SEC under Chair Gensler's tenure, which leads me to my last point. This is from Patrick McHenry. He is a congressman from North Carolina. And he says, Chair Gamble's enforcement team's egregious misconduct will have broad implications on SEC authority beyond his crypto crusade. <laughs> Gensler requested more funding for enforcement last year. Now a judge calls out the SEC's abusive and deceptive legal practices. This must end. There will be repercussions. Okay, the, 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 there will be repercussions was actually me. I just, that's not what Patrick said, but he said this must end. And I think they're going to actually have to bring this to a vote and have a discovery period in, within Congress. And also as a reminder, we have a presidential election coming up. I think Gary is kind of a liability right now at this point. And of course, we can take a look at data, different data, different statistics about how many people actually in the United States actually own crypto, how many people actually trade. It's quite a bit. And it's, it's actually becoming one of a, uh, of a major issue around these different candidates. Uh, you have no farther to look uh, than in Massachusetts and John Deaton uh, versus Pocahontas, or excuse me, uh, Elizabeth Warren. And uh, that's actually a, a case or a, an opportunity for a seat to be placed. But as a reminder, who appointed Gary Gensler? Who? Well, it was President Joe Biden. Nothing against Joe Biden. I know some people love Joe Biden. Some people hate Joe Biden. Some people don't care about him. But Joe Biden nom nominated Gensler to serve as 33rd chair of the U.S. Security and Change Commission. He succeeded SEC Acting Chair Allison Lee. So if there is a movement in the president and who is sitting in office, I do not believe it will be Gary Gensler. And again, I do believe he's a liability, but I could be wrong. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then also, let's talk about some good news as far as alts. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Akash, which is a uh, deep in AI play, which... I've been investing in over on uh, crypto.com because I couldn't get it on Coinbase. Uh, Akash will be uh, listed actually today. It was actually listed two hours ago, 12 p.m. Eastern time if, if liquidity conditions are met. Oh, they were met. And if you're curious about Akash, world premier decentralized compute marketplace, it's an open network that lets users buy and sell computing resources securely and efficiently purpose built for public utility. And of course, this is really good for AI because it uses computational resources and they need a lot of those GPUs to actually run and keep the network up, not just to keep the network up, but to actually foster an increase in the amount of artificial intelligence that will eventually destroy the world. That's just me saying it. So the question was, well, how well did it do? It did great. So I know people will say, ah, the Coinbase effect isn't really that much. This is the last 24 hours. And yes, Akash has done pretty well the last time, but Again, the time frame. It started at 12 Eastern Standard Time. This is Atlantic Standard Time. This is my time zone here in Puerto Rico, but right now we're on the same time frame. So at 11.50, it was at $5.33. And then at 12 o'clock, 5.35, and then whew, they just took a big jump to six bucks. So I know people will say, ah, there's, there's no Coinbase effect. Just a little bit. I think that's what it is. And I think Akash is going to do quite well. I could be wrong, but uh, let me know what your favorite AI plays in there. But lastly, lastly, and then we'll do the Q&A, is as a reminder, there's two deadlines coming up. And I think this is kind of funny that I talked about Gary Gensler and we have to pay off his debt for his screw up <laughs> so we can pay taxes, so they can tax the tar out of us. Uh 
but that's how it is, unfortunately. So this is where we live. I don't want you to be in trouble, but I want you to minimize your taxes as best as possible. I want you to make it as easy as you can without having your head explode. In that case, there's two things. First of all, taxes. Then there's a, a Roth IRA deadline. If you're into Roth IRAs like myself, you have until April 15th to contribute to 2023 timeframe. Why is this important? I'll tell you in a second. So first of all, I use CoinLedger. We all know that. There's a link in the description for CoinLedger. Get some uh, percentage off. But they just had a partnership with MetaMask yesterday, actually today. So what that means is that when you're going through the process of adding in all your different wallets with MetaMask, it doesn't matter if you have MetaMask Ethereum, you have MetaMask uh, BNB, if you have MetaMask uh, uh, Polygon or any kind of layer two solution, uh, it will import easily and quickly because there is a partnership together with CoinLedger. And again, when I've done this, I've used them. This will be my third straight year from the time that I start up the, the program to get everything in for my different wallets and then ship it off to my CPA it takes me 30 minutes. I cannot stress enough how much I do not like to have time wasted. And that's one of them. So take a look at that. And also if you're into uh, Roth IRAs, I know people love the Bitcoin ETF. They think an e Ethereum ETF is coming. I personally, and from what the stats say, it's looking pretty, that's less than 50%. I just want to remind people that, yeah, it's great that you can do a Bitcoin ETF and you can put in your IRA. But just remember that if you're doing this, you know, there's management fees for these ETFs. You got limited trading hours and tracking errors potentially. But with, with iTrust, you don't have that. And what's great about iTrust is that, again, I've been using them for three years, is that it's not just, I'm not with Bitcoin. I can have gold and silver, which I own both in my Roth IRA. I know, shocking, I still like precious metals, but I have all these different things. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, XRP, I mean, not me, Actually, that's not true. I do have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, XRP, and Avalanche. <laughs> How crazy. And there's a host of different other cryptos that you can put in there. And what's great about it is if, for instance, you're like, okay, I think EOS is going to do awesome, but I don't think it's going to you know, be here for the next you know, five years when I turn 59 or whatever. Uh, so in that situation, maybe you want to trade within your IRA. And guess what? There's, it's tax-free when you trade within your IRA. And there's no fees excuse me, there's no monthly fees. It's a 1% transaction fee, what you do in your uh, IRA account. But again, something that uh, you might want to think about because the uh, the limitation is April 15th when you can contribute up to 7,000 or 8,000. And then if you want to do for 2024, you can do it the day after. So that's it for today. Just want to bring that to everybody's attention, but that's it. So if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.